There's that old saying, no use crying over spilled milk, but what about dumped milk and tens if not hundreds of thousands of gallons of dumped milk or tens of thousands of euthanized chickens or pork processing plants that are just shut down overnight. One farmer says this is going to get a lot worse before it gets better and that food shortages are on the horizon. That farmer joins us today. We are in Clearwater tonight. I'm Allison Morrow. Hi, I'm Allison Morrow. I'm Allison Morrow. And I've gone to a lot of places. On St. Pete Beach, Allison Morrow. And now with my former Force Recon Marine husband, I'm going off grid ish. All right, so we're really fortunate to have Dwayne Faber on today. He is a dairy farmer in the Skagit Valley. And Dwayne, I guess first, if we could just get straight to like how life has changed for you on the farm um, because of all of this. Like I've heard some horror stories of people dousing, you know, milk down the drain because they just can't get rid of it to the tune of like tens of thousands of dollars. Um, Run us through just like for you personally, what your life is like. And then, you know, as you're talking to your neighbors, what's going on with that? Right. So I'm in the Skagit Valley about an hour and a half North of Seattle. So as of right now, what we ship our milk to Dairy Gold, and Dairy Gold has not been, had to dump milk so far. Uh, a lot of the milk that's being dumped now is being or is in the Midwest for cheese plants or plants that uh, supply the restaurant industry or the food service industry, and so those plants are really struggling just because their sales evaporated overnight, and then there's no way for them to go with this wall of milk that every day is heading towards their processing plants, and there's no place for them to go, and so. By us locally here, we have not experienced those same issues. The biggest thing for us is making sure that our employees stay safe. We're doing our best to keep them social distanced. We're uh, cleaning down. We're Cloroxing areas, the common areas where employees are working and, and sitting and having lunch and trying to do our best on uh, keeping any any spread between them as, uh, as minimal as possible. What about... Um food costs that, you know, the price of milk, for instance, like, have you all seen any difference in the consumer market? And has that affected business? Absolutely. That's probably been one of the the better things out of this is a lot more people are drinking fluid milk now. Cereal sales have skyrocketed. Uh, The kids are at home now. Mom and dad have to, you know, make breakfast, lunch and dinner at home for the kids. And so fluid milk sales is actually going up. But then uh, that 30% that we were shipping into the restaurant industry, the food service industry, that demand has been destroyed and, and that's not going to come back. And it's similar to, you know, like in the hog industry or the pig industry, when somebody goes out to eat to a restaurant, they go and they'll say, hey, yeah, I'll have a cheeseburger and I'll put bacon on it. I'll have a bacon cheeseburger. But when you're sitting at home, you're not going to go and grill up you know, three strips of bacon for your bacon cheeseburger. So you just kick the bacon out of it. And so you're not consuming the bacon. And for a while there, the, they were seeing bacon sales plummeting as well. And so we have these weird little idiosyncrasies that, hey, we're eating this in a restaurant, but we're not necessarily eating at home. And that's created a huge disruption in the supply chain. So I want to take us to the first article, this one from the Associated Press. This is dated April 12, 2020. It's titled, Smithfield Closes South Dakota Pork Plant Due to Coronavirus. Um, Just scrolling down, it's talking about the Virginia-based Smithfield Foods announced Sunday that it is closing its pork processing plant in Sioux Falls until further notice after hundreds of employees tested positive for the coronavirus, a step the head of the company warned could hurt the nation's food supply. And then going down to the CEO's statement, quote, the closure of this facility combined with a growing list of other protein plants that have shattered, sorry, shuttered across our industry is pushing our country perilously close to the edge in terms of our meat supply. Smithfield president and CEO Kenneth Sullivan said, it is impossible to keep our grocery store stocked if our plants are not running. These facility closures will also have severe, perhaps disastrous repercussions for many in the supply chain, first and foremost, our nation's livestock farmers. So just from your standpoint, I mean, I know you do dairy, so it's a little different. Um, but when it comes to the system, the food system in the United States, I mean, this is something that a lot of people hadn't really started talking about until recently. And I think now, like this was one of the big headlines that made people a little bit nervous that there may be some tougher times ahead. What's your takeaway from this article? I think we are going to get to the point where the National Guard comes in and takes over these processing plants. Because we are heading for a time where we are going to have meat shortages. 
and meat factories in particular have individuals that are working side by side on a conveyor belt as meat is going by. And so they're in really confined close quarters to each other. And that's conducive to the spread of coronavirus. Uh, we're seeing it locally here. There was a potato processing plant that had a shut down, a similar situation where people are working on a line and that COVID just started going through the employees. And meat is a, is a critical part of our national food, food service. And so at some point, it's going to be temporarily nationalized. That's my prediction because we are going to have uh, meat shortages and we're going to run out of meat. The dairy industry, we, we've escaped it largely in that there's a lot more separation. There's not as much of, you know, not, not as many people side by side on a food line. Uh, the reason that they've shuttered is because of lack of demand. They couldn't sell their product into kind of these specialized restaurants. But the, the meat situation, it's definitely close quarters for these employees. And uh, the spread of COVID is, is happening one after another at, at all these, these meat factories. And it's going to be happening in uh, fruit and vegetable processing, too, uh, unless there's safeguards taken. There's talk that they're putting plexiglass in, in between each individual worker to help try and prevent some of that. But it's, it's a dire situation, and it's only going to get worse, and we're only going to hear about it more and more. Curious if, say, that does come to be your prediction about nationalizing some of these plants. What does that look like does, for the consumer, I mean, or the product itself, or the farmer? Mm -hmm. I mean, how does that change things? Does it make it better in some cases and worse in other cases? Does it make it worse all around or better all around? I mean, how, how does that play out? So actually the bigger crisis and what we're going to be facing now is these animals that were destined to be slaughtered don't have a place to be killed now. And particularly in pigs, you can't just keep feeding a pig for an extra three months. The, the meat starts going bad. And so there, we're going to hear stories of farmers just having to kill pigs and bury them. And it may happen. I think it happened already in chickens, and it's possible that it happens in beef. Although beef, there's a little more flexibility on extending the life of the, of the cow in order to wait until the, the plants start opening up again. From the consumer side, absolutely. I think there's going to be disruptions in meat. I think we're going to be going to grocery stores and there won't be meat available because of this. That point brings us to this next article that we are going to talk about, and that is the egg issue that you just brought up, um, the chicken issue. Egg demand shifted, and 61,000 Minnesota chickens were euthanized. This is from the Star Tribune, April 21st, 2020. Uh, it starts off by saying, Carrie Mergen, a contract egg farmer near Albany, Minnesota, got word on a Wednesday the chickens in his barn would be euthanized. A crew showed up the next morning and started gassing the birds with carbon dioxide. The sudden drop in demand for food at restaurants, school cafeterias, and caterers shut down by the pandemic has ripped through farming. Milk has been dumped, eggs smashed, and ripe lettuce plowed under. Now farms are killing animals sooner than planned. Now, what I would love for you to enlighten us on about this is, what is a contract farmer, and how does somebody who's been caring for 61,000 chickens just have folks show up one day and gas them all? So a contract farmer typically is a farmer that doesn't own the chickens in his barn. It's a farmer that owns the barn itself, and he's the one that manages the barn and manages the chickens that are in the barn. And so it's done often in hogs and also in chickens, where even the hogs are not owned by the farmer themselves, but they're owned by the corporation that is going to go come and grab them and take them and slaughter them. And so when the company goes and says, hey, we've had demand fall through the floor. We've got eggs that are going bad in our warehouses. We've got no place to send the eggs. They have to stop the bleeding. And so they have to go to the farmer and euthanize the chickens that are continuing to produce these eggs. And they have to stop that food from continuing to come in because there's really no place for them to go with it. Similar to in the chickens, uh, the, you know, chicken wings, we're not going and eating deep fried chicken wings at home, but then we're very quick to go to Buffalo Wild Wings or watch the game and eat, eat chicken wings. Well, that demand has just evaporated. And so the chickens that are slotted for restaurants, for chicken wings, they don't have a home to go now and they can't keep stockpiling it. I mean, that's, that's complete demand destruction. Even if we open up, we're not going to catch up. And so agriculture, we have this, this difficult situation and this heart-wrenching situation where we're going to have to euthanize animals because the demand just isn't there because of shifting consumer demands and, and the appetite for what consumers are eating at home versus in a restaurant. 
So, yeah, it's incredibly unfortunate and it breaks a farmer's heart to do that, right? I mean, we want to utilize the entire portion of the animal. We want to take an animal and, and use every part of it and, and respect the life that the animal has given to us. And so it's incredibly difficult for a farmer to go out and, and see all these animal euth animals euthanized for, for really no reason at all. Do you think farmers at this point are thinking that consumers get this or do you think they're still kind of like because i know that among farmers there's a general sentiment that the average person like doesn't really know what's involved in getting the food to their table um do you think farmers are still like man maybe this is going to wake consumers up or do you think farmers at this point are still like it, 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 it there's such a disconnect between the consumer and the farmer that you know even in a pandemic like this it's going to be too late before people start paying attention and 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 figuring out how to get through this, I guess how how to how to fix this system. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. Both of my grandparents came from Holland, and they were young young boys and girls all through World War II, and so they went through periods where they did not have food to eat. They went hungry. They were sitting there eating tulips. They were eating, you know, they had one bunny rabbit that they hid up in the rafters to to keep away from from raiding armies. And when they came here, they said there's a lack of appreciation for agriculture and a lack of appreciation for food. And they said that changes when you go through a war and when you go through a famine. And in a lot of ways, I think after this is over, consumers will appreciate food and will appreciate agriculture a whole lot more. And I think we'll realize that agriculture and food is a national security issue. The reason that Europe has quite socialized agriculture is because people went hungry. And people understand what it's like to go hungry. In the U.S. in particular, we're very much free market, lowest cost producer wins. And, and that may shift. There may be an appreciation for local food, for food that's produced in your area. And uh, in, it, that may be some of the good part that comes out of it. And so many of consumers, they go to the grocery store and uh, Whole Foods and, hey, the meat is just there. Or Safeway and the meat is just there. They don't understand the channels that it takes to bring that meat to the grocery store. And so I, absolutely, we're going to become more intimate with our food supply chain and, and it's going to be good. I think as farmers, we want to have the public know what we're doing and, and have that transparency. And so they can appreciate it and know that when they're buying the meat in the store, where it's coming from, how it's getting there. And, and this disaster is really shining a light on that. We would be, uh, shocked if you heard a uh, parent say i'm i'm looking for like the the cheapest um elementary school or something I, even if it's the dumbest teacher i just want the cheapest mm -hmm. you know option available mm -hmm. um but we go to the grocery store of this mindset that what we're putting in our bodies doesn't matter so we should be able to pay 50 cents for something that took a farmer dollars and dollars to produce it's the thing that for me i feel like i want to spend the most money on because it's the thing i put in my body literally multiple times a day and so i'd rather invest there than have brand new purses or shirts or whatever else and um comparatively to our parents and grandparents generation we spend significantly less on food than they did we're spending it more on cell phones or whatever else it is um you know 250 dollars, 300 dollars cable bills and i don't see anything wrong kind of like you do with having to reevaluate that i mean i think they're you know in some cases you hear people say i just want to go back to normal like there's a part of me that's like, I don't want to go back to normal in that sense. I want to go back to reevaluating like how we can have a better community, better society as a whole, and especially promoting the hard work of people like farmers so that, um, you know, the priorities are stacked in the right order. And definitely like farmers are at the top of my pyramid. Um, you know, for you, I'm just curious, like what's the time frame? that we see any of this kind of flush itself out. Obviously, like there are a lot of people who are hopeful we lift the order, um, maybe mid-May, end of May, we just all go back to normal and everything's fine. Then you hear other people that are like, it's the next Great Depression. We've got a third of the pe of workforce um, unemployed at this point. And then who knows like when we're going to start really seeing <laughs> the effects of these food shortages. You've got already riots. Um, 
in places like South Africa who have seen this problem a little bit ahead of us? Like, do we get to that point? Do we figure this out earlier? What's your prediction on the timeline? It's kind of interesting because at first there was a demand destruction. And so we were pushing agriculture products into warehouses and they weren't moving. And it, and it wasn't necessarily even just meat. I mean, it was the potato industry, the potato industry in eastern Washington. They've got one third of their potatoes sitting in storage, some billion pounds of potatoes that aren't being eaten because we're not going out and eating French fries and, and eating in restaurants like we typically do. And so we're going to work through some of those products, but there's going to be a huge disparity between some products that all of a sudden there's huge demand for and others where there isn't much demand for. And But meat in particular, absolutely. I think we're going to get to a point where we're going to have shortages. We're not going to be able to go to the grocery store and buy, you know, pork tenderloin or, or a steak. And how soon does that happen? I'm not sure what the inventory levels look like. Uh, but at this point, for like Smithfield shutting down for two weeks, that's going to have an impact. Somebody's going to be running out of pork in their, in their grocery store. Uh, when that happens, I'm not sure exactly, but it's definitely going to happen. And Americans are going to have to learn to do without. I mean, we go into a grocery store today and never before in history, I mean, have you been able to go and buy grapes year round or buy apples year round or uh, buy pork year round? I mean, the richest kings and queens didn't have that 100 years ago. And so the American cons consumer has been incredibly blessed with, with having access to that food. And for the first time, I think in a long time, we're going to go to the grocery store and not be able to get that food that we want. And as far as time frame, how long does it last? We'll see how long these uh, these shutdowns last in the in the manufacturing side and then the on the the meat packing side. But it's definitely going to come. What would be your recommendation to a consumer that's like, okay, I want to take this opportunity to become a better shopper a better supporter of agriculture i know for us like we got to know the rancher down the street from us and we bought a quarter of a cow and we stocked our freezer and i don't know how like those folks are differing from a market like someone who's a contract farmer somebody who sells to, like a smithfield if you're selling direct to consumers i'm guessing that situation is probably a little different but what's your you know if you could get a message to consumers right now since you got their attention what would that be I do exactly what you did i mean and it is happening across the country people are going and looking for local meat and going out and buying a big deep chest freezer where they can go and store a half a cow a quarter of a cow and, and know your local farmer, know where your food came from. And that's a beautiful thing. I mean, you're supporting somebody local. You're su supporting your neighbors. Uh, go, go out and buy the cow. Go out and buy the freezer and start having a, a more intimate knowledge of your food and where your food comes from. Over the next couple of weeks, you're going to hear ugly stories. You're going to hear stories of farmers having to shoot animals and bury them. And that is going to touch the psyche of the consumer in a very deep and intimate way. And I just want consumers to know that as what, what, the, what the customer is feeling and what the consumer is feeling is felt tenfold on the farmer side. You know, that's an incredibly difficult thing for somebody that cares for animals and loves animals and wants to see them live a full and complete life and then go into the food system to be enjoyed by people. And it's going to be difficult to see it and it's going to be difficult to hear those stories uh, but just know that it's hurting the farmers as well. And it, and really it's, it's necessary because there is no way to process these animals in a way where we can use, utilize them fully. And Dwayne, I do want to make sure people can keep following you because you have a pretty big presence on Twitter um, and you're 75% farmer, but also do a little bit of comedy, which we could use every once in a while in today's <laughs> current situation. So how, <laughs> how is the best place for people to just keep hearing your thoughts on all this and, and other things? Absolutely. At DFaber84 is my Twitter handle. And I usually post a few things there a day and try and keep it light and humorous, but also engaging and let the consumers know what we see on, on the agriculture front and on the agriculture side. 
All right, Dwayne Faber, dairy farmer in the Skagit Valley of Washington State. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for taking the time. Any video right now that discusses COVID-19 or the economic consequences or really any other angle to it is at high risk of getting buried by YouTube, censored, demonetized, and shadow banned. And so it does help creators like myself when the audience takes time to share the video themselves with people who would also like this content. Again, I'm Allison Morrow. Please subscribe to the channel and I'll see you next time.